Chapter One, Part One of A Group of Noble Dames by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Dame the First, the First Countess of Wessex, by the local historian. Part One. King's Hintock Court, said the narrator, turning over his memoranda for reference. King's Hintock Court is, as we know, one of the most imposing of the mansions that overlook our beautiful Blackmoor, or Blackmoor, Vale. On the particular occasion of which I have to speak, this building stood, as it had often stood before, in the perfect silence of a calm, clear night, lighted only by the cold shine of the stars. The season was winter, in days long ago, the last century having run but little more than a third of its length. North, south, and west, not a casement was unfastened, not a curtain undrawn. Eastward, one window on the upper floor was open, and a girl of twelve or thirteen was leaning over the sill. That she had not taken up the position for purposes of observation was apparent at a glance, for she kept her eyes covered with her hands. The room occupied by the girl was an inner one of a suite, to be reached only by passing through a large bedchamber adjoining. From this apartment, voices in altercation were audible, everything else in the building being so still. It was to avoid listening to these voices that the girl had left her little cot, thrown a cloak round her shoulders, and stretched into the night air. But she could not escape the conversation, try as she would. The words reached her in all their painfulness, one sentence in masculine tones, those of her father, being repeated many times. "'I tell you there shall be no such betrothal. I tell you there shan't. A child like her?' She knew the subject of the dispute to be herself. A cool feminine voice, her mother's, replied, "'Have done with you, and be wise. He is willing to wait a good five or six years before the marriage takes place, and there's not a man in the country to compare with him.' It shall not be. He's over thirty. It is wickedness. He is just thirty, and the best and finest man alive, a perfect match for her. He is poor. But his father and elder brothers are made much of at court, none so constantly at the palace as they, and with her fortune, who knows, he may be able to get a barony. I believe you are in love within yourself. How can you insult me so, Thomas? And is it not monstrous for you to talk of my wickedness, when you have a like scheme in your own head? You know you have. Some bumpkin of your own choosing, some petty gentleman who lives down at that outlandish place of yours, Falls Park, one of your pot companion sons. There was an outburst of imprecation on the part of her husband in lieu of further argument. As soon as he could utter a connected sentence, he said, "'You crow when you domineer, miss, because you are heiress general here. You are in your own house, and you are on your own land. But let me tell ye that if I did come here to you instead of taking you to me, it was done at the dictates of convenience merely. Hell, I'm no beggar. Hadn't I a place of my own? Hadn't I an avenue as long as thine?' Hadn't I beeches that will more than match thy oaks? I should have lived in my own quiet house and land contented if you had not called me off with your airs and graces. Faith, I'll go back there. I'll not stay with thee longer. If it had not been for our Betty, I should have gone long ago. After this, there were no more words. But presently, hearing the sound of a door opening and shutting below, the girl again looked from the window. Footsteps crunched on the gravel walk, and a shape in a drab greatcoat, easily distinguishable as her father, withdrew from the house. He moved to the left, and she watched him diminish down the long east front till he had turned the corner and vanished. He must have gone round to the stables. She closed the window and shrank into bed, where she cried herself to sleep. This child, their only one, Betty, beloved ambitiously by her mother, and with uncalculating passionateness by her father, was frequently made wretched by such episodes as this, though she was too young to care very deeply for her own sake whether her mother betrothed her to the gentleman disgust or not. The squire had often gone out of the house in this manner, declaring that he would never return, 
but he had always reappeared in the morning. The present occasion, however, was different in the issue. The next day she was told that her father had ridden to his estate at Falls Park early in the morning on business with his agent, and might not come back for some days. Falls Park was over twenty miles from King's Hintock Court, and was altogether a more modest centrepiece to a more modest possession than the latter. But as Squire Dornell came into view of it that February morning, he thought he had been a fool ever to leave it, though it was for the sake of the greatest heiress in Wessex. Its classic front, of the period of the second Charles, derived from its regular features a dignity which the great battlemented heterogeneous mansion of his wife could not eclipse. Altogether he was sick at heart, and the gloom which the densely timbered park threw over the scene did not tend to remove the depression of this rubicund man of eight-and-forty, who sat so heavily upon his gelding. The child, his darling Betty, there lay the root of his trouble. He was unhappy when near his wife, and he was unhappy when away from his little girl, and from this dilemma there was no practicable escape. As a consequence, he indulged rather freely in the pleasures of the table, and became what was called a three-bottle man, and in his wife's estimation, less and less presentable to her polite friends from town. He was received by the two or three old servants who were in charge of the lonely place, where a few rooms only were kept habitable for his use, or that of his friends when hunting. And during the morning he was made more comfortable by the arrival of his faithful servant Topcombe from King's Hintock. But, after a day or two spent here in solitude, he began to feel that he had made a mistake in coming. By leaving King's Hintock in his anger, he had thrown away his best opportunity of counteracting his wife's preposterous notion of promising his poor little Betty's hand to a man she had hardly seen. To protect her from such a repugnant bargain, he should have remained on the spot. He felt it almost as a misfortune that the child would inherit so much wealth. She would be a mark for all the adventurers in the kingdom. Had she been only the heiress to his own unassuming little place at Falls, how much better would have been her chances of happiness. His wife had divined truly when she insinuated that he himself had a lover in view for this pet child, the son of a dear deceased friend of his, who lived not two miles from where the squire now was, a lad a couple of years his daughter's senior, seemed, in her father's opinion, the one person in the world likely to make her happy. But as to breathing such a scheme to either of the young people with the indecent haste that his wife had shown, he would not dream of it. Years hence would be soon enough for that. They had already seen each other, and the squire fancied that he noticed a tenderness on the youth's part which promised well. He was strongly tempted to profit by his wife's example, and forestall her matchmaking by throwing the two young people together there at Falls. The girl, though marriageable in the views of those days, was too young to be in love, but the lad was fifteen, and already felt an interest in her. Still better than keeping watch over her at King's Hintock, where she was necessarily much under her mother's influence, would be to get the child to stay with him at Falls for a time, under his exclusive control. But how to accomplish this without using main force? The only possible chance was that his wife might, for appearance sake, as she had done before, consent to Betty paying him a day's visit, when he might find means of detaining her, till Reynard, the suitor whom his wife favoured, had gone abroad, which he was expected to do the following week. Squire Dornell determined to return to King's Hintock and attempt the enterprise. If he were refused, it was almost in him to pick up Betty bodily and carry her off. The journey back, vague and chaotic as were his intentions, was performed with a far lighter heart than his setting forth. He would see Betty and talk to her, come what might of his plan. So he rode along the dead level which stretches between the hills skirting Falls Park and those bounding the town of Ivell, trotted through that borough and out by the King's Hintock Highway, till, passing the villages, he entered the mile-long drive through the park to the court. The drive being open, without an avenue, the squire could discern the north front and the door of the court a long way off, and was himself visible from the windows on that side, for which reason he hoped that Betty might perceive him coming, as she sometimes did on his return from an outing, and run to the door or wave her handkerchief. 
but there was no sign. He inquired for his wife as soon as he set foot to earth. "'Mistress is away. She was called to London, sir.' "'And Mistress Betty?' said the squire blankly. "'Gone likewise, sir, for a little change. Mistress has left a letter for you.' The note explained nothing, merely stating that she had posted to London on her own affairs, and had taken the child to give her a holiday. On the fly-leaf were some words from Betty herself to the same effect, evidently written in a state of high jubilation at the idea of her jaunt. Squire Dornell murmured a few expletives, and submitted to his disappointment. How long his wife meant to stay in town she did not say, but on investigation he found that the carriage had been packed with sufficient luggage for a sojourn of two or three weeks. King's Hintock Court was, in consequence, as gloomy as Falls Park had been. He had lost all zest for hunting of late, and had hardly attended a meet that season. Dornell read and re-read Betty's scrawl, and hunted up some other such notes of hers to look over, this seeming to be the only pleasure there was left for him. That they were really in London he learnt in a few days by another letter from Mrs. Dornell, in which she explained that they hoped to be home in about a week, and that she had no idea he was coming back to King's Hintock so soon, or she would not have got away without telling him. Squire Dornell wondered if, in going or returning, it had been her plan to call at the Reynard's place near Melchester, through which city their journey lay. It was possible that she might do this in furtherance of her project, and the sense that his own might become the losing game was harassing. He did not know how to dispose of himself, till it occurred to him that, to get rid of his intolerable heaviness, he would invite some friends to dinner and drown his cares in grog and wine. No sooner was the carouse decided upon than he put it in hand, those invited being mostly neighbouring landholders, all smaller men than himself, members of the hunt, also the doctor from Evershead, and the like, some of them rollicking blades whose presence his wife would not have countenanced had she been at home. "'When the cat's away,' said the squire. They arrived, and there were indications in their manner that they meant to make a night of it. Baxby, of Sherton Castle, was late, and they waited a quarter of an hour for him, he being one of the liveliest of Dornell's friends, without whose presence no such dinner as this would be considered complete, and, it may be added, with whose presence no dinner which included both sexes could be conducted with strict propriety. He had just returned from London, and the squire was anxious to talk to him, for no definite reason, but he had lately breathed the atmosphere in which Betty was. At length they heard Baxby driving up to the door, whereupon the host and the rest of his guests crossed over to the dining-room. In a moment Baxby came hastily in at their heels, apologizing for his lateness. "'I only came back last night, you know,' he said, "'and the truth o't is, I had as much as I could carry.' He turned to the squire. "'Well, Dornell, so cunning Reynard has stolen your little ewe lamb, ha ha!' "'What?' said Squire Dornell, vacantly, across the dining-table round which they were all standing, the cold March sunlight streaming in upon his full, clean-shaven face. "'Surely thou knowest what all the town knows. You've had a letter by this time.' "'that Stephen Reynard has married your Betty. "'Yes, as I'm a living man. "'It was a carefully arranged thing. "'They parted at once, "'and are not to meet for five or six years. "'But, Lord, you must know.' "'A thud on the floor was the only reply of the squire. "'They quickly turned. "'He had fallen down like a log behind the table "'and lay motionless on the oak boards. "'Those at hand hastily bent over him "'while the whole group were in confusion.' They found him to be quite unconscious, though puffing and panting like a blacksmith's bellows. His face was livid, his veins swollen, and beads of perspiration stood upon his brow. "'What has happened to him?' said several. "'An apoplectic fit,' said the doctor from Evershead gravely. He was only called in at the court for small ailments as a rule, and felt the importance of the situation. He lifted the squire's head, loosened his cravat and clothing, and rang for the servants, who took the squire upstairs. There he lay as if in a drugged sleep. The surgeon drew a basin full of blood from him, but it was nearly six o'clock before he came to himself. The dinner was completely disorganized, and some had gone home long ago, but two or three remained. 
"'Bless my soul!' Baxby kept repeating. "'I didn't know things had come to this pass between Dornell and his lady. "'I thought the feast he was spreading today was in honour of the event, "'though privately kept for the present. "'His little maid married without his knowledge.' "'As soon as the squire had recovered consciousness, he gasped. "'Tis abduction! Tis a capital felony! He can be hung! Where is Baxby? I am very well now. What items have you heard, Baxby? The bearer of the untoward news was extremely unwilling to agitate Dornell further, and would say little more at first. But an hour after, when the squire had partially recovered and was sitting up, Baxby told as much as he knew, the most important particular being that Betty's mother was present at the marriage and showed every mark of approval. "'Everything had been done so regularly that I, of course, thought you knew all about it,' he said. "'I knew no more than the underground dead that such a step was in the wind. "'A child not yet thirteen. How hath Sue outwitted me? "'Did Reynard go up to London with him, you know?' "'I can't say. All I know is that your lady and daughter were walking along the street "'with the footman behind them, and they entered a jeweller's shop where Reynard was standing, "'and that there—' In the presence of the shopkeeper and your man, who was called in on purpose, your Betty said to Reynard, so the story goes, upon my soul I don't vouch for the truth of it, she said, will you marry me, or I want to marry you, will you have me now or never, she said. What she said means nothing, murmured the squire, with wet eyes. Her mother put the words in her mouth to avoid the serious consequences that would attach to any suspicion of force. The words be not the child's. She didn't dream of marriage. How should she, poor little maid? Go on. Well, be that as it will, they were all agreed, apparently. They bought the ring on the spot, and the marriage took place at the nearest church within half an hour. A day or two later, there came a letter from Mrs. Dornell to her husband, written before she knew of his stroke. She related the circumstances of the marriage in the gentlest manner, and gave cogent reasons and excuses for consenting to the premature union, which was now an accomplished fact indeed. She had no idea, till sudden pressure was put upon her, that the contract was expected to be carried out so soon, but, being taken half unawares, she had consented, having learned that Stephen Reynard, now their son-in-law, was becoming a great favourite at court, and that he would, in all likelihood, have a title granted him before long. No harm could come to their dear daughter by this early marriage contract, seeing that her life would be continued under their own eyes exactly as before for some years. In fine, she had felt that no other such fair opportunity for a good marriage with a shrewd courtier and wise man of the world, who was at the same time noted for his excellent personal qualities, was within the range of probability, owing to the rusticated lives they led at King's Hintock. Hence, she had yielded to Stephen's solicitation, and hoped her husband would forgive her. She wrote, in short, like a woman who, having had her way as to the deed, was prepared to make any concession as to the words and subsequent behaviour. All this Dornell took at its true value, or rather perhaps at less than its true value. As his life depended upon his not getting into a passion, he controlled his perturbed emotions as well as he was able, going about the house sadly and utterly unlike his former self. He took every precaution to prevent his wife knowing of the incidents of his sudden illness, from a sense of shame at having a heart so tender, a ridiculous quality, no doubt, in her eyes, now that she had become so imbued with town ideas. But rumours of his seizure somehow reached her, and she let him know that she was about to return to nurse him. He thereupon packed up, and went off to his own place at Falls Park. Here he lived the life of a recluse for some time. He was still too unwell to entertain company, or to ride to hounds or elsewhither. But more than this, his aversion to the faces of strangers and acquaintances, who knew by that time of the trick his wife had played him, operated to hold him aloof. Nothing could influence him to censor Betty for her share in the exploit. He never once believed that she had acted voluntarily. Anxious to know how she was getting on, he dispatched the trusty servant Tupcombe to Evershead Village, close to King's Hintock, timing his journey so that he should reach the place under cover of dark. 
The emissary arrived without notice, being out of livery, and took a seat in a chimney corner of the sow and acorn. The conversation of the droppers in was always of the nine days wonder, the recent marriage. The smoking listener learnt that Mrs. Dornell and the girl had returned to King's Hintock for a day or two, that Reynard had set out for the continent, and that Betty had since been packed off to school. She did not realise her position as Reynard's child's wife, so the story went, and though somewhat awe-stricken at first by the ceremony, she had soon recovered her spirits on finding that her freedom was in no way to be interfered with. After that, formal messages began to pass between Dornell and his wife, the latter being now as persistently conciliating as she was formerly masterful. But her rustic, simple, blustering husband still held personally aloof. Her wish to be reconciled, to win his forgiveness for her stratagem, moreover a genuine tenderness and desire to soothe his sorrow, which welled up in her at times, brought her at last to his door at Falls Park one day. They had not met since the night of the altercation before her departure for London and his subsequent illness. She was shocked at the change in him. His face had become expressionless, as blank as that of a puppet, and what troubled her still more was that she found him living in one room and indulging freely in stimulants, in absolute disobedience to the physician's order. The fact was obvious that he could no longer be allowed to live thus uncouthly. So she sympathized and begged his pardon and coaxed. But, though after this date there was no longer such a complete estrangement as before, they only occasionally saw each other, Dornell for the most part making Falls his headquarters still. Three or four years passed thus. Then she came one day, with more animation in her manner, and at once moved him by the simple statement that Betty's schooling had ended, she had returned, and was grieved because he was away. She had sent a message to him in these words, "'Ask father to come home to his dear Betty.' "'Ah, then she is very unhappy,' said Squire Dornell. His wife was silent. "'Tis that accursed marriage,' continued the squire. Still his wife would not dispute with him. "'She is outside in the carriage,' said Mrs. Dornell gently. "'What? Betty?' "'Yes.' "'Why didn't you tell me?' Dornell rushed out, and there was the girl awaiting his forgiveness, for she supposed herself, no less than her mother, to be under his displeasure. "'Yes, Betty had left school and had returned to King's Hintock. She was nearly seventeen and had developed into quite a young woman.' She looked not less a member of the household for her early marriage contract, which she seemed indeed to have almost forgotten. It was like a dream to her, that clear, cold March day, the London church, with its gorgeous pews and green baize linings, and the great organ in the West Gallery, so different from their own little church in the shrubbery of King's Hintock Court. The man of thirty, to whose face she had looked up with so much awe and with a sense that he was rather ugly and formidable, the man whom, though they corresponded politely, she had never seen since, one to whose existence she was now so indifferent that if informed of his death, and that she would never see him more, she would merely have replied, Indeed, Betty's passions as yet still slept. "'Hast heard from thy husband lately?' said Squire Dornell, when they were indoors, with an ironical laugh of fondness which demanded no answer. The girl winced, and he noticed that his wife looked appealingly at him. As the conversation went on, there were signs that Dornell would express sentiments that might do harm to a position which they could not alter. Mrs. Dornell suggested that Betty should leave the room till her father and herself had finished their private conversation, and this Betty obediently did. Dornell renewed his animadversions freely. "'Did you see how the sound of his name frightened her?' he presently added. "'If you didn't, I did. Zwoons, what a future is in store for that poor little unfortunate wench of mine! I tell ye, Sue, t'was not a marriage at all in morality, and if I were a woman in such a position, I shouldn't feel it as one. She might, without a sign of sin, love a man of her choice as well now as if she were chained up to no other at all.' "'There, that's my mind, and I can't help it. "'Ah, Sue, my man was best. He'd have suited her.' "'I don't believe it,' she replied incredulously. "'You should see him. Then you would. 
"'He's growing up to a fine fellow, I can tell ye.' "'Hush, not so loud,' she answered, rising from her seat "'and going to the door of the next room, "'whither their daughter had betaken herself. "'To Mrs. Dornell's alarm, there sat Betty in a reverie, "'her round eyes fixed on vacancy, "'musing so deeply that she did not perceive her mother's entrance. "'She had heard every word, and was digesting the new knowledge.' Her mother felt that Falls Park was dangerous ground for a young girl of the susceptible age, and in Betty's peculiar position, while Dornell talked and reasoned thus. She called Betty to her, and they took leave. The squire would not clearly promise to return and make King's Hintock his permanent abode, but Betty's presence there, as at former times, was sufficient to make him agree to pay them a visit soon. All the way home, Betty remained preoccupied and silent. It was too plain to her anxious mother that the Squire Dornell's free views had been a sort of awakening to the girl. The interval before Dornell redeemed his pledge to come and see them was unexpectedly short. He arrived one morning, about twelve o'clock, driving his own pair of black bays in a curical phaeton with yellow panels and red wheels, just as he had used to do, and his faithful old Tupcombe on horseback behind. A young man sat beside the squire in the carriage, and Mrs. Dornell's consternation could scarcely be concealed, when, abruptly entering with his companion, the squire announced him as his friend Phillipson from Elm Cranlinch. Dornell passed on to Betty in the background, and tenderly kissed her. "'Sting your mother's conscience, my maid,' he whispered. "'Sting her conscience by pretending you are struck with Phillipson, and would a loved him as your father's choice much more than him that she forced upon ye.' The simple-souled speaker fondly imagined that it was entirely in obedience to this direction that Betty's eyes stole interested glances at the frank and impulsive Phillipson that day at dinner, and he laughed grimly within himself to see how this joke of his, as he imagined it to be, was disturbing the peace of mind of the lady of the house. "'Now Sue sees what a mistake she has made,' said he. Mrs. Dornell was very greatly alarmed, and as soon as she could speak a word with him alone, she upbraided him. "'You ought not to have brought him here. Oh, Thomas, how could you be so thoughtless? Lord, don't you see, dear, that what is done cannot be undone, and how all this foolery jeopardizes her happiness with her husband? Until you interfered and spoke in her hearing about this Phillipson, she was as patient and as willing as a lamb, and looked forward to Mr. Reynard's return with real pleasure.' Since her visit to Falls Park she has been monstrous close-mouthed and busy with her own thoughts. What mischief will you do? How will it end? Own, then, that my man was best suited to her. I only brought him to convince you. Yes, yes, I do admit it. But, oh, take him back again at once. Don't keep him here. I fear she is even attracted by him already. Nonsense, Sue. Tis only a little trick to tease ye. Nevertheless, her motherly eye was not so likely to be deceived as his, and if Betty was really only playing at being love-struck that day, she played it with the perception of a Rosalind, and would have deceived the best professors into a belief that it was no counterfeit. The squire, having obtained his victory, was quite ready to take back the too attractive youth, and early in the afternoon they set out on their return journey. A silent figure who rode behind them was as interested as Dornell in that day's experiment. It was the staunch Tupcombe, who, with his eyes on the squire's and young Phillipson's back, thought how well the latter would have suited Betty, and how greatly the former had changed for the worst during these last two or three years. He cursed his mistress as the cause of the change. After this memorable visit to prove his point, the lives of the Dornell couple flowed on quietly enough for the space of a twelvemonth, the squire for the most part remaining at Falls, and Betty passing and repassing between them now and then, once or twice alarming her mother by not driving home from her father's house till midnight. The repose of King's Hintock was broken by the arrival of a special messenger. Squire Dornell had had an excess of gout so violent as to be serious, he wished to see Betty again. Why had she not come for so long? Mrs. Dornell was extremely reluctant to take Betty in that direction too frequently, but the girl was so anxious to go, her interests latterly seeming to be so entirely bound up in Falls Park and its neighborhood, that there was nothing to be done but to let her set out and accompany her. 
Squire Dornell had been impatiently awaiting her arrival. They found him very ill and irritable. It had been his habit to take powerful medicines to drive away his enemy, and they had failed in their effect on this occasion. The presence of his daughter, as usual, calmed him much, even while, as usual, too, it saddened him, for he could never forget that she had disposed of herself for life in opposition to his wishes, though she had secretly assured him that she would never have consented had she been as old as she was now. As on a former occasion, his wife wished to speak to him alone about the girl's future, the time now drawing nigh at which Reynard was expected to come and claim her. He would have done so already, but he had been put off by the earnest request of the young woman herself, which accorded with that of her parents on the score of her youth. Reynard had deferentially submitted to their wishes in this respect, the understanding between them having been that he would not visit her before she was eighteen, except by the mutual consent of all parties. But this could not go on much longer, and there was no doubt, from the tenor of his last letter, that he would soon take possession of her whether or no. To be out of the sound of this delicate discussion, Betty was accordingly sent downstairs, and they soon saw her walking away into the shrubberies, looking very pretty in her sweeping green gown and flapping broad-brimmed hat overhung with a feather. On returning to the subject, Mrs. Dornell found her husband's reluctance to reply in the affirmative to Reynard's letter to be as great as ever. "'She is three months short of eighteen, he exclaimed. "'Tis too soon, I won't hear of it.' If I have to keep him off, sword in hand, he shall not have her yet. But, my dear Thomas, she expostulated, consider if anything should happen to you or me, how much better it would be that she should be settled in her home with him. I say it is too soon, he argued, the veins of his forehead beginning to swell. If he gets her this side of Candlemas, I shall challenge in. I'll take my oath on it. I'll be back to King's Hintock in two or three days, and I'll not lose sight of her, day or night. She feared to agitate him further, and gave way, assuring him, in obedience to his demand, that if Reynard should write again before he got back, to fix a time for joining Betty, she would put the letter in her husband's hands, and he should do as he chose. This was all that required discussion privately, and Mrs. Dornell went to call in Betty, hoping she had not heard her father's loud tones. She had certainly not done so this time. Mrs. Dornell followed the path along which she had seen Betty wandering, but went a considerable distance without perceiving anything of her. The squire's wife then turned round to proceed to the other side of the house, by a short cut across the grass, when, to her surprise and consternation, she beheld the object of her search sitting on a horizontal bough of a cedar, beside her being a young man, whose arm was round her waist. He moved a little and she recognized him as young Phillipson. Alas, then, she was right. The so-called counterfeit love was real. What Mrs. Dornell called her husband at that moment, for his folly in originally throwing the young people together, it is not necessary to mention. She decided in a moment not to let the lovers know that she had seen them. She accordingly retreated, reached the front of the house by another route, and called at the top of her voice from a window, "'Betty!' For the first time since her strategic marriage of the child, Susan Dornell doubted the wisdom of that step. Her husband had, as it were, been assisted by destiny to make his objection, although trivial, a valid one. She saw the outlines of trouble in the future. Why had Dornell interfered? Why had he insisted upon producing his man? This, then, accounted for Betty's pleading for postponement whenever the subject of her husband's return was broached. This accounted for her attachment to Falls Park. Possibly this very meeting she had witnessed had been arranged by letter. Perhaps the girl's thoughts would never have strayed for a moment if her father had not filled her head with ideas of repugnance to her early union, on the ground that she had been coerced into it before she knew her own mind, and she might have rushed to meet her husband with open arms on the appointed day. Betty at length appeared in the distance in answer to the call, and came up pale, but looking innocent of having seen a living soul. Mrs. Dornell groaned in spirit at such duplicity in the child of her bosom. This was the simple creature for whose development into womanhood they had all been so tenderly waiting, a forward minx, old enough not only to have a lover, 
but to conceal his existence as adroitly as any woman of the world. Bitterly did the squire's lady regret that Stephen Reynard had not been allowed to come and claim her at the time he first proposed. The two sat beside each other almost in silence on their journey back to King's Hintock. Such words as were spoken came mainly from Betty, and their formality indicated how much her mind and heart were occupied with other things. Mrs. Dornell was far too astute a mother to openly attack Betty on the matter. That would only be fanning flame. The indispensable course seemed to her to be that of keeping the treacherous girl under lock and key until her husband came to take her off her mother's hands. That he would disregard Dornell's opposition and come soon was her devout wish. It seemed, therefore, a fortunate coincidence that on her arrival at King's Hintock a letter from Reynard was put into Mrs. Dornell's hands. It was addressed to both her and her husband, and courteously informed them that the writer had landed at Bristol, and proposed to come to King's Hintock in a few days, at last to meet and carry off his darling Betty, if she and her parents saw no objection. Betty had also received a letter of the same tenor. Her mother had only to look at her face to see how the girl received the information. She was pale as a sheet. "'You must do your best to welcome him this time, my dear Betty,' said her mother gently. "'But—but I—' "'You are a woman now,' added her mother severely. "'And these postponements must come to an end. "'But my father—oh, I am sure he will not allow this. "'I am not ready. "'If he could only wait a year longer, "'if he could only wait a few months longer. "'Oh, I wish, I wish my dear father were here. "'I will send to him instantly.' She broke off abruptly, and falling upon her mother's neck, burst into tears, saying, "'Oh, my mother, have mercy upon me. I do not love this man, my husband.' The agonized appeal went too straight to Mrs. Dornell's heart for her to hear it unmoved. Yet things having come to this pass, what could she do? She was distracted, and for a moment was on Betty's side. Her original thought had been to write an affirmative reply to Reynard, allow him to come to King's Hintock, and keep her husband in ignorance of the whole proceeding, till he should arrive from Falls on some fine day after his recovery, and find everything settled, Reynard and Betty living together in harmony. But the events of the day, and her daughter's sudden outburst of feeling, had overthrown this intention. Betty was sure to do as she had threatened, and communicate instantly with her father, possibly attempt to fly to him. Moreover, Reynard's letter was addressed to Mr. Dornell and herself conjointly, and she could not in conscience keep it from her husband. "'I will send the letter on to your father instantly,' she replied soothingly. "'He shall act entirely as he chooses, and you know that he will not be in opposition to your wishes. He would ruin you rather than thwart you. I only hope he may be well enough to bear the agitation of this news.' Do you agree to this? Poor Betty agreed, on condition that she should actually witness the dispatch of the letter. Her mother had no objection to offer to this, but as soon as the horseman had cantered down the drive towards the highway, Mrs. Dornell's sympathy with Betty's recalcitration began to die out. The girl's secret affection for young Phillipson could not possibly be condoned. Betty might communicate with him, might even try to reach him. Ruin lay that way. Stephen Reynard must be speedily installed in his proper place by Betty's side. She sat down and penned a private letter to Reynard, which threw light upon her plan. "'It is necessary that I should now tell you,' she said, "'what I have never mentioned before. Indeed, I may have signified the contrary, that her father's objection to your joining her has not yet been overcome. As I personally wish to delay you no longer, am indeed as anxious for your arrival as you can be yourself, having the good of my daughter at heart. No course is left open to me but to assist your cause without my husband's knowledge. He, I am sorry to say, is at present ill at Falls Park, but I felt it my duty to forward him your letter. He will therefore be like to reply with a peremptory command to you to go back again for some months, whence you came, till the time he originally stipulated has expired. My advice is, if you get such a letter, take no notice of it, but to come on hither as you had proposed, letting me know the day and hour, 
after dark if possible, at which we may expect you. Dear Betty is with me, and I warrant you that she shall be in the house when you arrive. Mrs. Dornell, having sent away this epistle unsuspected of anybody, next took steps to prevent her daughter leaving the court, avoiding if possible to excite the girl's suspicion that she was under restraint. But, as if by divination, Betty had seemed to read the husband's approach in the aspect of her mother's face. "'He is coming!' exclaimed the maiden. "'Not for a week,' her mother assured her. "'He is then? For certain?' "'Well, yes.' Betty hastily retired to her room, and would not be seen. To lock her up, and hand over the key to Reynard when he should appear in the hall, was a plan charming in its simplicity, till her mother found, on trying the door of the girl's chamber softly, that Betty had already locked and bolted it on the inside, and had given directions to have her meals served where she was, by leaving them on a dumb-waiter outside the door. Thereupon Mrs. Dornell noiselessly sat down in her boudoir, which, as well as her bedchamber, was a passage-room to the girl's apartment, and she resolved not to vacate her post night or day till her daughter's husband should appear, to which end she arranged to breakfast, dine, and sup on the spot. It was impossible now that Betty should escape without her knowledge, even if she had wished, there being no other door in the chamber except the one admitting to a small inner dressing-room inaccessible by any second way. But it was plain that the young girl had no thought of escape. Her ideas ran rather in the direction of entrenchment. She was prepared to stand a siege, but scorned flight. This, at any rate, rendered her secure. As to how Reynard would contrive a meeting with her coy daughter while in such a defensive humour, that, thought the mother, must be left to his own ingenuity to discover. Betty had looked so wild and pale at the announcement of her husband's approaching visit that Mrs. Dornell, somewhat uneasy, could not leave her to herself. She peeped through the keyhole an hour later. Betty lay on the sofa, staring listlessly at the ceiling. "'You are looking ill, child,' cried her mother. "'You have not taken the air lately. Come with me for a drive.' Betty made no objection. Soon they drove through the park towards the village, the daughter still in the strained, strung-up silence that had fallen upon her. They left the park to return by another route, and on the open road passed a cottage. Betty's eye fell upon the cottage window. Within she saw a young girl about her own age, whom she knew by sight, sitting in a chair and propped up by a pillow. The girl's face was covered with scales, which glistened in the sun. She was a convalescent from smallpox, a disease whose prevalence at that period was a terror of which we at present can hardly form a conception. An idea suddenly energized Betty's apathetic features. She glanced at her mother. Mrs. Dornell had been looking in the opposite direction. Betty said that she wished to go back to the cottage for a moment to speak to a girl in whom she took an interest. Mrs. Dornell appeared suspicious, but observing that the cottage had no back door, and that Betty could not escape without being seen, she allowed the carriage to be stopped. Betty ran back and entered the cottage, emerging again in about a minute, and resuming her seat in the carriage. As they drove off, she fixed her eyes upon her mother, and said, "'There, I have done it now.' Her pale face was stormy, and her eyes full of waiting tears. "'What have you done?' said Mrs. Dornell. "'Nanny Priddle is sick of the smallpox,' and I saw her at the window, and I went in and kissed her so that I might take it, and now I shall have it, and he won't be able to come near me. Wicked girl, cries her mother. Oh, what am I to do? What, bring a distemper on yourself and usurp the sacred prerogative of God because you cannot pallet the man you've wedded? The alarmed woman gave orders to drive home as rapidly as possible, and on arriving, Betty, who was by this time also somewhat frightened at her own enormity, was put into a bath and fumigated, and treated in every way that could be thought of to ward off the dreadful malady that in a rash moment she had tried to acquire. There was now a double reason for isolating the rebellious daughter and wife in her own chamber and there she accordingly remained for the rest of the day and the days that followed, till no ill results seemed likely to arise from her willfulness. End of chapter 1, part 1